Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. There are lots of nutrition tubs out there, but none can match the true blue commitment of Vitalix. Our tubs offer you the most concentrated nutrition at the lowest cost per day. That means more profit for your operation and improved performance for your cow herd. In fact, research shows Vitalix tubs increase feed efficiency by 20% while boosting conception rates, herd health, and weaning weights. Learn more at Vitalix.com. Vitalix, the true blue tub. Alrighty, folks, today we are going to be talking with Craig Gifford about anti-suckling devices for weaning. I know it's July, but we do want to be thinking about weaning here in the next couple months, depending on, I guess, if you're a traditional spring calving system in the Midwest. So Craig's going to talk about um, a project he did where they looked at um, the effectiveness of anti-suckling devices and kind of who these devices are work for, who they don't work for, and yeah, with some other basic weaning tips and strategies in there as well to help with rate of gain and overall animal health too. Now, before we dive into that, I do want to remind you that I am open for speaking gigs here for the end of 2023 and into 2024, whether that's doing a workshop or a keynote or a Zoom meeting, connecting with an audience or connecting with your Facebook group. Please be sure to head to my website, casualcattleconversations.com and hit the contact us page and you can connect with me there and we can chat about talking about advocacy, finding your voice, podcasting, uh, whatever it may be um, at your next event. But with that, let's visit with Craig. Well, good afternoon, Craig. It is great to have you on the podcast. I know I've appreciated our email and phone call correspondence, so it's nice to kind of meet you over Zoom, and I'm excited to have you speak with my audience today, so thank you. Oh, yeah, great, and thank you, Shay, for uh, having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. So we are going to be talking about a little bit of research you did with the anti-suckling devices for a weaning procedure. But before we dive into that, can you give a little bit of a background about what you're doing in the beef industry today? What's your career kind of look like? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, I currently work as the beef extension specialist here at New Mexico State University. So uh, with that, we run a lot of uh, extension programmings around the, around the state and region associated really with all aspects of, of beef production. Uh, some of our main focus at the moment is on new technologies associated like virtual fencing. And then also we have a, we do a lot of work with uh, bovine respiratory disease and beef cattle reproduction. Well, awesome. I, I know we got to talk a little bit about the virtual fencing earlier on one of our previous phone calls, and that's been a topic on the show before too. So it's exciting to see what all the universities are universities are doing research-wise. So did you grow up in the beef industry too? Yeah, I grew, I grew up in uh, northern Wyoming. And uh, yeah, we had, a, we worked uh, on a, I grew up in northern Wyoming. We had a beef cattle operation, also uh, worked with uh, rodeo animals quite a bit during that time. Uh, and then after that, of course, all the way through college, I stayed uh, within the animal science programs. And even, you know, during the undergraduate times, most of our, our part-time jobs were always with the beef industry from night calving and and those kind of things in the winters of Wyoming. So uh, you've been involved with it most of my life. Well, awesome. I, I love to hear that. So kind of transitioning the conversation into the anti-suckling devices for weaning, just because that's a it's a new topic for the show and not something that I've heard talked about a whole lot. Can you kind of give a little bit of background on the purpose behind using an anti-suckling device for a weaning procedure? Yeah, sure. They've they've been around for a little while now. Um, they've uh, the the concept to this is is really a two step weaning process, and so the idea with the nose flaps or the weaning devices are to sort of separate the need of that calf for the mother's for suckling or the mother's milk. Uh, by the time these are used, most of the calves are already on feed. They're they're eating grass. They're fully developed from that capacity. So the the need for suckling isn't there any longer. Obviously, we'll be weaning them soon. 
So the idea behind these is again, to block that suckling ability of the calf, but allow them to re remain in contact with the dam uh, with the thought being to lower stress on the calf uh, in the next phase of weaning, which of course is physical separation. So if someone were to like implement this, you called it a two-step procedure. What would that look like if they were doing uh, like their, would you put the nose flaps in or rings in like when you'd precondition or would you do that on the second time and you'd actually kind of work those calves three times or what would that look like? Yeah, and that's most of the work that that is, is variable time frames that I've seen in the literature. And you know, ranches I imagine would ex have to experiment with this, but I'm going to just throw six days out there as, as sort of a, and I don't know if I'm going to call it consensus, but it's something you see pretty frequently. Uh, and so what that looks like is as you prepare for weaning or processing of these calves, you'll get you would gather the cat or gather the cows, run the calves through the chute, apply the uh, nose flap or the weaning dev anti suckling device, and then um, and then you return the calves with their mothers, uh, with the dams, and then and then you're looking at and I've seen from four days, six days, even up to like 28 days, uh, in different experiments. You would regather at that time and, of course, remove remove the uh, nose flaps. And that's when you would also do uh, the physical separation from the dam. OK, so do you know what um, an average cost is on one of the nose flaps or an anti suckling device? Yeah, I think most of those are running, you know, and this is a ballpark number depending on the type and some have spikes, some don't have spikes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's several different varieties, but in general, uh, they run anywhere from two to three dollars per unit. Um, you're going to lose. I've seen in the I've seen in the literature anywhere from thirty percent to uh, ten percent loss of these. So you will lose some, which which is going to increase that cost a little bit, unless you happen to find them out there. But I don't <laughs> think that's very likely in most cases. So, uh, but two to three dollars, and then you're going to lose some along the way. Okay, so you kind of said that the main purpose of using this method was that it's one of the lowest stress methods you can have for weaning calves, correct? You know, so um, it, it, that's the intent of, of, of that particular product. Um, you, the idea is that they still have contact with the dam. So theoretically that there will be less stress associated um, there's a couple of theories though, going on, I guess, in the, in the scientific literature, one of those is that you don't necessarily decrease the overall stress. You just spread it out more over the two periods. And so uh, I don't know if, if that applies. Um, then, of course, there's been some more recent work coming out of Brazil uh, that at least down there and within the lower cross and the lower cattle and the lower cross cattle. So more of a boss indicus, mm -hmm. boss indicus cross. They, they actually had a pretty significant amount of like uh, lesions within the nose as a result of this. So in their particular case, um, gains were down and they theorized that stress was up due to these. So, you know, as with any weaning situation, it may be either breed and or ranch dependent. Okay. But with that, what you saw, did you see gains increase in your particular case when you were working with them? Or what did you kind of see as far as a rate of gain for those calves? Yeah, we've we've dabbled with this a little bit and, and I hesitate to, to extend it to a very formal publication because a lot of what we've done is summarize the data that's out there. Um, what I'll tell you is that most of the studies and in, in ours included that the nose flaps or or the weaning devices in combination with fence line weaning um, tended to have the most gains over over that weaning period. Uh, now, if you try to separate the weaning devices from the fence line weaning, I think the data gets a little more scattered. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm not sure that that I can tell you that there's a consensus. Yes, if you're going to use these, you will get this this gain increase. Um, but those that have reported gains, and and there are studies out there that have um, anywhere from you know about a half a pound a day plus or minus increased gains versus those that did not have the weaning device. 
Um, and it's important though to distinguish because while the nose flaps are in, in general, you're going to have a reduction in gains because you're removing the milk side of things. Where they see the bump in or the studies that have reported that, the bump comes in the next phase that then then they tend to gain the, more than the calves that didn't receive that anti-suckling device. And I think that makes sense because now for the first time, they're going without without the milk from the mom side of things. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense a little bit, uh, I think. Hey folks, I want to take a quick break from the episode to talk about my friends at Corel Technologies. Corel Technologies is changing the way cattle producers cross fence and utilize their pastures with their easy to use and cost effective virtual fencing program. Virtual fencing allows you to save time, cut costs, and get the most out of your grazing lands by remotely containing, moving, and tracking your cows. This was designed by a cow-calf producer for cow-calf producers. Check out their podcast episode with me from July 27th to get an in-depth look at the process of virtual fencing and how it is impacting the beef industry as we know it today. If you would like to see the system work in person, feel free to reach out through their website about field days. You can also find more information on their website, www.corraltech.com. So what about on the animal health side as far as calves getting sick with anything like that once they've been separated from their mothers was there any conclusive data as far as any differences in that um you know i have not seen that's always the biggest thing with with weaning is you're worried about this uh, bovine respiratory disease is the most common on on these fresh weaned calves um i haven't seen a study and nor with ours that we had enough numbers to really uh, really differentiate that, meaning there weren't just a lot of reports of morbidity or mortality in any of the groups. So uh, those are hard to differentiate a little bit. I think the bigger concern, or and I don't know if it's a concern, but the reports of the lesions within the nose and what that can be, you know, what that could ultimately run uh, run into from a from a health or stress perspective. Okay, so <clears throat> what types of producers or systems are you seeing this work for? Is it people who are selling their calves off the cow? Is it people who are backgrounding or is it kind of a little bit of everything? <laughs> you know, and, and that's a really good question. We get a, we get a lot of uh, weaning questions and, and it's really sort of market dependent and ranch dependent. So I'll give you a scenario. I know of a ranch that's using these and they love, they love the use of these. They'll gather the cows out of the bigger pastures and and out here, you know, our bigger pastures are, you know, 10,000 acres, 20,000 acres. So they're very, very large pastures typically. Um, but then they'll bring the cows into a smaller trap area, apply those, and then they ship them. And they just don't have the weaning capacity to do anything after that. And they're doing private contracts. So their buyers like them to do that for the calves. Um, that's one scenario that I've, I've seen it used, at least within our production system. Um, and other systems where they just, they come off of the mountains or that type of thing, they don't have the facilities to really hold them or handle them. They just wean them right off of the cow and ship them. So in that case, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Um, and then a lot of our, our cattle are just weaned onto grass. And, and in those cases, a lot of them don't mess with handling them other than the vaccinations and that kind of thing. So they'll just, they don't want to regather those calves to remove the, re remove the nose, de nose device. Okay. So if a cow calf producer out there right now is kind of wondering if they should look into this, what are some questions they should ask themselves to kind of figure out if this might be a good solution for them? I, yeah, and that's a, also a good question. I think anytime you approach your weaning strategy, you, you have to look at how you're marketing animals. So of course, our biggest thing are gains and, and health. That's what we focus on around weaning. And so um, as you look at those two scenarios, you think, how are you going to improve those? Okay. And how are you going to get paid back for the effort you put in? And I think those are the questions that you ask. And so if I look at this, I'm looking at, if I put the nose flaps in, I have to handle the calves at least twice because I'm going to be uh, running them through the chute mm -hmm. once to put the flaps in. 
and then or the weaning devices in and then I'm going to be removing those. Now, realistically, that's probably only one additional time through the shoot because you're already vaccinating and that type of thing. So I think it, it depends on your marketing strategy, what you're how you're how you're already marketing your calves. And also it depends on your facilities and it also depends on um, so, sort of what your problems you're already experiencing. And so if, you're, if your current system is working pretty well for you, these may, may or may not add anything to you. If you're having some problems, this might be an option that you can do this with. So kind of a big picture question that I like to ask quite a few of my guests would be, if you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing about how cattle producers wean their calves, since that's the topic today, what would you change? Ooh, one thing relative to weaning. Wow, just one. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually my, that, that's a common response too. <laughs> yeah, Um. So so with, I would say, do as much as you can prior to the weaning stress as possible. And so what I mean by that, um, when we do things like leave bulls intact to weaning to try to increase gains, uh, really, if you wade through the data, yeah, you will have increased gains potentially. It depends on the data set up through the summer months due to leaving them bulls intact. But by the time you castrate them in the fall, there's so much, the, the testicles are so much more developed that oftentimes you lose that weight advantage. And, but then you also expose yourself to greater respiratory disease risk just to the enhanced stress at that time. So do things like dehorn, definitely vaccinate, castrate, do as much of that while the calf is young and really set him up for success, him, him or her up for success. Because uh, when that calf is a newborn, that's the first chance or, or around that branding time, that's the first chance to really prime that immune system and get ready for this weaning period. And so, you know, if I could say one thing is, is do as much of that before weaning as you can. So when you're weaning, uh, you're minimizing all the branding, the dehorning, as much of that stuff as you possibly can uh, to really minimize the stress, uh, the overall stress load of that calf at weaning. So am I summarizing that correctly if I'm saying spread out the stressors? Yeah, I think that you know, for sure we we take these calves in and, and we've had experience with this um, in, in feedlot research. And, you know, we do respiratory disease research at times and collaboratively with several universities. And if you want to, this sounds a little bit twisted, but you have to have sick calves to do respiratory disease research. So if you want calves that are going to get sick, you get fresh weaned, naive bull calves. So fresh weaned, right off of their mom, they're still intact and they've never they've never seen a vaccine needle. And I promise you, you're gonna get a lot of sick calves out of those. So as a consequence, they're gonna get discounted more by the buyers too. So we pay less for them, but we have a lot higher death loss or a lot more treatment rates with those. So you're exactly right. Anything you do to increase your stress level substantially is going to decrease the effectiveness of things like your vaccination programs and your health programs and your nutrition programs. And so if you can spread that out, get most of that knocked out at branding time. So weaning time is usually just a vaccination and a, and a weaning uh, time. I think those are those are really good practices. All right. Well, Craig, as we kind of wrap up today, is there anything else you want to mention or share with the audience on this quick episode? Yeah, no, I, I would say, you know, and in, in we work with people out here all the time on, on similar situations and, you know, don't fall into the trap that, you know, this worked for so-and-so, but didn't work for me or whatever. There, a lot of these systems are ranch dependent. And, and some that we haven't published yet in, in relation and examples, fence line weaning, We've seen situations where pasture size, and this is a bit anecdotal at this point, we haven't published it yet, but pasture size influences how well that works. If the cows are, or the calves, excuse me, are really condensed down into a small pasture and the cows are as well, and you put them across the fence line, 
they just stay there ball ball and and are very vocal and aren't really eating or going on pasture now on the flip side if we wean them and both pastures are really big then they kind of kind of hang around the fence line for a day or two and then they're gone they kind of disperse pretty much so you know always analyze your situation individually on your ranch uh, things like we anti-suckling devices or, or weaning devices they can work well in some situations and and fence line weaning can work well in some situations and it just it really depends on your operation all right well craig thank you very much for being on the show today i really appreciate it yeah no problem and that's a wrap on that one folks thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.